Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. And today we are going to be going over the parable of the barren fig tree. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk. And then I publish two videos a week. I publish a video about books, and then I also publish a replay of this Bible study with some study aids along with it. So if you are interested in either of those things, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications so you can get updates about new videos. So uh, this year has been about the parables of Jesus, and I we did take a little bit of a break to do a study on Easter, and then a study in Hebrews, and then since we came back after um, after Pentecost, we've been back in the parables, and we've really been looking at how uh, Jesus's parables really pulled from a lot of cultural elements of his day. Some of those were common Jewish teachings. Some of them were Greek stories. Some of them were these, um, these just common ideas and common themes that were in, you know, just in the culture at large. And so today we are going to be, uh, going over the parable of the barren fig tree. So let's just start this time with a prayer. Lord, thank you for this day, and we invite in your presence of the Holy Spirit to, to teach and guide us. So, Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand and to see things clearly as you as you see things. Um, thank you for teaching us today in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, um, this parable of the barren fig tree is only found in the Gospel of Luke, but there are other references to actual happenings about a barren fig tree. So we're going to start there first about these other accounts, and then we're going to go and read the parable of the barren fig tree, and we are going to see what that barren fig tree represents. Okay, so I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation, if you're going to follow along, and the passages that we're going to be reading, we're going to be reading Matthew 21, 33 through 41, Mark 11, 12 through 14, and then we're going to go to the parable itself in Luke 13, 6 through 8. Okay. So let's start in, actually, let's start in Mark. I always like starting in Mark because that was the earliest gospel. And we can compare and contrast a little bit. So I like to, I like to start with the beginning. So Mark chapter 11, we're going to read a little bit before this. And this is when Jesus, this is the week going into Passover. Okay, so these are things that happened right before the crucifixion. And so... Um, before Passover, Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey and the Jews welcomed him and acknowledged him as, you know, the one that came in the name of the Lord. Um, they said, pray, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessing on the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David, praise God in the highest heaven. So he, at this time is corporately acknowledged as that Messiah, right? So then he goes to the temple. This is in verse 12. Um, and let's this this is what happens right before he gets to the temple so verse 12 the next morning as they were leaving bethany jesus was hungry he noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off so he went over to see if he could find any figs but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit then jesus said to the tree may no one ever eat your fruit again and the disciples heard him say it when they arrived back in jerusalem jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. That evening, Jesus sent his disciples to the city. In our Bible study on Lazarus and the rich man, we found found that um, that account was probably a direct um, addressed Ky Annas, um, who was pretty much the power behind you know the high priest for almost a generation. So he, he was high priest at one point, and then his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was high priest when Jesus was crucified, and then his, his other sons. And so we, we studied that. So and we also found that uh, this 
this Annas and his sons were really almost kind of like the mob. I mean, they had a lockdown on um, all everything that was going on at the temple. So the when Jesus went in and um, and drove them out of the temple, he was basically this was basically a direct uh, confrontation with Annas, this religious power of the day who were completely completely corrupt. The the fig tree is often a symbol for Israel. So what we can see what these these two parallels here is that the the fig tree has the show of goodness, right? All these green leaves, but there's no fruit. And then he goes into the temple, which is supposed to be about worshiping God and giving honor to God, and really they're using it to rip out off their fellow citizens. So this is a confrontation, and he curses a fig tree, right? He says, no one's ever going to have fruit on you again. So then, verse 20, the next morning as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Normally that doesn't happen, unless if you know the, there's something that attacks the roots. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. And then, the the and we'll just read through the end of the chapter, in verse 27, again, they entered Jerusalem. As Jesus was walking through the temple area, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, can you imagine this? So this is all a very short period of time. So he goes in, drives out the, the money changers and, and all the people selling stuff. They go out and then he just strolls back in. Can you imagine like how, how upset people were? Just, just picture that, picture that scene. Okay. Um, where are we? And then tw verse 28, they demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? <laughs> Can, oh, I just have to stop. Can you imagine the disciples? Like, if you were the disciples, wouldn't you have been uncomfortable? Wouldn't you have been a little nervous that Jesus is just walking in after he's just, like, basically declared war on Annas? Okay. Um, verse 28. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right to do them? <laughs> I tell you by what authority I do these things. If you answer one question, Jesus said, did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? Answer me. They talked it over among themselves. So if we say it was from heaven, he will ask what we did. Them. But do we dare say it was merely human? For they were afraid of what people would do because they won't believe that John was a prophet. So what they, they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. So here's the thing. Um, again, like go watch that Bible study on Lazarus and the rich man because we talk a little bit more about like what was going on at the time. But um, the the high priest actually had no that were Caiaphas really had no right to be there because it was hereditary, and um, they weren't in that line, and, and there hadn't been a a, a true. A, a true high priest in the heredit hereditary line since like I think it was like 175 BC. So they had no right to be there. They're, they're going and they're, they're complete sellouts. And then they're coming and they're saying, who are you to do this? And see, at this time, it had been 400 years of silence. And then John comes. And many people believe that John was a prophet and that he spoke for God. So you have these people in there who have no um, hereditary right to be the high priest. And then John, you know, when Jesus said, who did John come from? And they're, they're not even going to say anything. Because the police, the people believe that John was a prophet of God, and so, you know, they the you know, the religious leaders and the Pharisees did not believe, did not listen to the prophet of God, and so they're really just kind of doing. Everybody's just kind of doing whatever they want to do. They're not even they have they have no authority. They have no authority. So we're going to be going to Matthew twenty one. So Matthew also gives a similar account to this as Mark. So Matthew actually took, you know, started with Mark's gospel. Matthew's gospel is not chronological, it's thematic. So he will work different parables in um, that were probably out of the chronological time period because he's making a specific point. 
So again, Matthew's gospel is primarily concerned with um, illustrating to the Jews how Jesus is the promised Messiah. And more than any other gospel, Matthew is constantly referring back to messianic prophecies and illustrating very clearly how how um, Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. So in this portion where he's talking, he gives an account of the fig tree. Um, Matthew gives kind of a condensed version. He just talks about the second path. He begins with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but in this one, he he highlights which prophecy that that fulfilled. So let's just start with that. And in uh, verse 1, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And this is in Isaiah 2.11, also Zechariah 9.9. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowds spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them along the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise to God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? They asked. And the crowds reply, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And this is um, going back to uh, Psalm 116, 25 through 26, and also uh, Psalm 148, 1. So you can see that Matthew gives a pretty similar account. They both saw that um, this acclamation of Jesus as you know, the promised Messiah is very significant, and then Matthew expands it a little bit. Now, one of the things on this, I've, I've seen every so often on the internet, I've seen that people see this account of the the donkey and its colt as like some sort of problem passage, and they're asking, okay, well, did he ride on the donkey or the colt, or like there's some confusion about it. So, this was a colt that hadn't been ridden, and so what they, they did is they took the donkey and they put the, the cloak over both of them. So so the colt, since it hasn't been broke, um, will, will stay, and they're able to, to lead, lead the colt while Jesus rode on it. Okay, so anyway, uh, then he goes into, in verse 12, he gives the same account of Jesus clearing out the temple. Then in verse 18, Matthew gives... Another account of, gives the account of the fig tree. You'll often see this in the Gospels where they're talking about the same thing, but some details are a little bit slightly different. Um, as I took a class uh, with, on scripture with Dr. Mike Lacona, and he has a book on that explains the differences that you see between the Gospels. And one of the things he said is that Mark is a girl version, Matthew is a guy version. So Matthew will, most of the time, will con- condense situations. He just doesn't go into huge amounts of detail. So in this situation, he condenses those two, those two um, accounts. So Mark is that they, they went into Jerusalem, they saw the fig tree, and Jesus cursed it because it wasn't bearing fruit. And then when uh, they came out, when they passed it again, when they were going back into Jerusalem, they saw that it had died, and they were amazed. Matthew just gives this one account um, of when they came, they came back to it, and um, his point is again, he's not. It's not necessarily he's not telling a story to give a, a blow by blow um, description of what happened. He's he's giving an account to to a purpose. And so his purpose in this, in, in Matthew's purpose, is to show that the uh, the corruption in the temple, and to he's making a point that that they're they're already cursed, that they've they've their Messiah has come, they've rejected him, um, they're plotting against him, and because of these evil actions, because they don't recognize truth, when it is in front of them, they're cursed. That they're they're basically there's going to be judgment. Then we're going to be going to, this is uh, Matthew 
account of the fig tree. This is in verse 18. In the morning, as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry, and he noted a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. Then he said to it, May, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Jesus told them, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. You can pray for anything if you have faith and you will receive it. And then it's going to, he goes into the same, um, it, Matthew presents the same confrontation with the Jewish leaders in verse 23. When Jesus returned to the temple and began teaching, the leading priests and elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. If you answer one question, Jesus replied, did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask us why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, he will be mobbed because the people believed John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. And then after this, in the chapter, he goes into the parable of the two sons um, and the parable of the evil farmers and uh, where the Pharisees know that he's speaking directly against them. And then the, in the next chapter, he goes into the parable of the wedding dinner. So that's the context of, of Matthew. So he's this cursing of the fig tree, as we've said that um, the fig tree is often a symbol for Israel. This is just another, this is another illustration that Matthew uses to show that God's judgment has fallen on Israel. Okay. So now we're going to go to the act, the parable of the fig tree in Luke 13. And Luke is, um, Luke's gospel is cr chronological and um, I, Luke is probably the only Gentile author of the New Testament, other than maybe the author of Hebrews. We're not sure who the author of that was, but Luke wrote this gospel and he was a companion to Paul. And in the beginning of the, his gospel, he talks, he you know tells the person he's writing it to that I have given you, given you this account. So you know how things happened in order because Mark's just, you know, he's telling out, telling stories, giving these accounts. This is an evangelistic gospel. Um, Matthew is talking about, you know, he's collecting these, these events and these, um, parables and assembling them to make a point rather than necessarily to give, um, to give a chronological account. And Luke is telling things you know, two. So there's a, a an orderly chronological account. And as we talked about last week in the, um, the illustration of Jesus in the door, um, that he drew heavily uh, from Virgil and the Aeneid, which was a very, very, like, probably the most popular work at the time. And I'll link to this again, but I in last week's Bible study, I linked to an article that Luke wasn't necessarily trying to copy the Aeneid, but he was using that structure as more of a, um, as a format. So one of the things that, um, people, when people look at the, the Bible accounts, the gospels seem normal to us in the West because they're telling, giving accounts and telling the stories. Um, I was in a discussion with someone one time that thought that revelation was very weird and didn't know why it was included. Revelation, the, the form of it itself, was actually more familiar to the Jews at the time than accounts like the Gospels. So, as Dr. Lacona had said, the Jews didn't didn't write really didn't really write accounts of their rabbis, um, and so he believes that uh, the Gospels are a form of Greek biography, which which is possible. It may be true. This other scholar that I'm I'll link to book is more of structured around this sort of epic structure. But again, they're drawing from their culture, and that culture is a lot broader than just, you know, the, the Jewish works, because Revelation is really, if you read any of the ap uh, apocalyptic literature of the intertestamental period, it's very, very similar. It fits right in with that, where these others are different, right? Okay, so we're going to go to chapter 13 and verse 1. 
in Luke. Okay. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Jesus asked. Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too, unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about all the about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next, you're fine. If not, then you can cut it. In my uh, study Bible, um, this is the Life Application Study Bible, um, we're, they're talking about what the tree is a symbol, symbol for. And I, as I said, the, the fig tree is often a symbol for Israel. Um, and then in, what was our Bible study that we did this on? Oh, the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, we looked at how... Uh, often leaders are referred to as trees, right? Okay. And then um, in this commentary, and on this in the third edition, it's on page 1757. In the Old Testament, a fruitful tree was often used as a symbol of godly living. For example, see, see Psalms 1-3, Jeremiah 17, 7-8. Jesus pointed out what would happen to the other kind of tree, the tree that looked took valuable time and space and still produce nothing for the patient gardener. By this illustration, Jesus warned his listeners that God would not tolerate their lack of productivity forever. Other, I don't really like that word. Productivity is not really a, the, a really good word for this. It's about fruitfulness, which isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean productivity, because then that kind of uh, almost seems like it's our works. So, does a tree work? No, it doesn't. It's the function of the tree. It's responding to the nutrients and the water, and it's just that's just how it's made, and it and it grows, right? So it's not a work of the tree. It's just fruitful because it's operating in the way that it's supposed to. When we are in Christ and we're allowing the Holy Spirit to operate in us, then that is the natural outcome. This fruit is a natural outcome, right? Okay. So, uh, Luke 3, 9 records John the Baptist's version of the same message. Have you been enjoying God's special treatment without giving anything in return? If so, respond to the gardener's patient care and begin to bear the fruit God has created you to produce. So what is that fruit? Let's go and look at um, Galatians chapter 5. And this kind of goes back to that that works versus versus grace, right? So through the grace of God, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and it's not a our works. It's the uh, it's that Jesus um, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again. And when we accept Him as our Savior, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit based on His work at the cross, not ours. And so, in the book of Galatians, uh, it's a letter that that Paul is writing after the Galatians have been visited by some uh, Judaizers, and they are believing that they have to. Uh, follow the law to be saved. And he's telling them, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And so then he looks at, goes back in, in chapter five, and he gives what the fruit of the spirit is. And so these are the types of things that should be seen in, in a believer's life. And so if these things aren't evident, then we need to start recognizing, okay, well, this isn't, this isn't how my life li lines up. So what is going on here? We need to willingly submit ourselves to God. Okay. So this is in Gal Galatians chapter five and verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. 
envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I, I want to stop right here because sometimes in the church, uh, mainly in the Western church, we see people who uh, think that God's grace gives them license to sin and that it's just all going to be forgiven. You, if you actually believe you will, you know, Jesus says over and over again that those who, you know, are truly my disciples will, will follow me and obey. They, if you're living like the world, then, you know, you're really not Jesus's, you're not following Jesus. And again, it's not our works, but we should be listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't think that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, I think you need to rethink that and check your salvation because if you're not hearing the Holy Spirit, um, as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me, right? And so if you're not hearing it, then you're probably not one of his sheep. And so I'd be having a conversation with God and really submitting yourself to God and, and asking him for that. Okay. So verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. That's what our life should look like, right? Okay. So one of the, I want to read, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of long, but I found, uh, I was like looking at what the early church fathers, uh, how they interpreted some of these, these same parables. And I really, really like seeing what Irenaeus had to say because Irenaeus was, um, he was actually the a very early theologian. Um, his work against heresies is considered the first work of systematic theology. Before that, they were just kind of trying to, they, they did have teachings, but it was basically responding to, you know, the persecution that was going on during the time. And there were some, there were some apologetics works, but as far as the whole work of theology, Irenaeus was the first. Irenaeus was also a disciple of Polycarp, who was taught by John the, John the Beloved. And so this is in his book, Against Heresies, um, book four, chapter 36. This whole book is, is basically about God's message, his continual call to his people. And so I'm going to link to this. Uh, uh, this site that I'm re reading from is New Advent. They have all of this online. Uh, also, another really great work resource is ccel.org. Any uh, theological work that's out of copyright will probably be online there. So in section one, he's talking about uh, the prophets were sent from one and the same father from whom this, the son was sent. Uh, he talks about the parable of the wicked the wicked husbandmen, and, and it goes on. And he's talking about like being good workmen, that we make good use of the time that we have. And then I really, really like this part. This is uh, section four, and he speaks directly about the fig tree. Since the Son of God is always one and the same, he gives to those who believe in him a well of water. John 4, 14, springing up to eternal life. So Jesus is, you know, the living water, right? But he causes the unfruitful fig tree immediately to dry up. And in the days of Noah, he justly brought on the deluge for purpose of extinguishing that most infamous race of men then existent, who could not bring forth fruit to God. Since the angels that had sinned commingled with them and acted as he did in order that he might put a check on the sins of these men, but at the same time, he might preserve the archetype, the formation of Adam. So I actually have a, a video, a review on the Unseen Realm by Dr. Michael Heiser. He talks about that. And actually, I'm going to be doing a review on Augustine's City of God. And uh, he had a different view of this. But I think it's interesting that Irenaeus understood it the same way as Dr. Heiser does. Augustine was wrong about that one. Okay. And it was he who rained fire and brimstone from heaven in the days of Lot upon Sodom and Gomorrah, an example of the righteous judgment of God, that all may know that every tree that brings not forth good fruit shall be cut down and cast into the fire. Matthew 3.10. And is he who uses the words that it will be more tol tolerable for Sodom in the general judgment than for, for those who beheld his wonders and did not believe in him and who do his will so also did he point that those who did not believe in him should have a more severe punishment in the ju judgment, thus extending equal justice to all, and being exact more from those to whom he gives the more 
The more, however, not because he reveals the knowledge of another father, as I have shown so fully and repeatedly, but because he has, by means of his advent, advent poured upon human grace the greater gift of paternal grace. So I really, I highly recommend going and reading the rest of this, this book of Irenaeus. So again, that's a book chapter four in or book four in Against Heresies. He really pulls in all these different um, teachings into this very cohesive message. So anyway, let's let's recap. So what is the parable of the barren fig tree about? It's about the fact that we all have to respond to this gift that we've been given. We've all been, you know, our we are created as God's imagers to be in communion with God and God's provided a way through his son to be in that fellowship. And we are all responsible to respond to that. And if we don't, there will be judgment. There will be judgment. And it's not, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, Jew, you know, Jew or Greek, where you came from, there is only one truth and that is Jesus. And so we are all accountable to respond to that. And it, and there will come a time when, if we don't bear the fruit, if we don't respond to the truth that we've given, if we don't, you know, enter the door that Jesus provides to be in fellowship and communion with our creator, then there'll come a time when we can no longer respond and, and there will, there will be judgment. And as for Christians, if your life isn't lining up with the fruits of the spirit, if, if what your actions are in direct opposition to what you say you believe, then you might want to question really where you're at because salvation is believing but if our word, our actions don't line up with what we say, we believe something's going to change. Either your actions are going to have to change or your beliefs will change and you won't be believing anymore. So don't get so close to the fire that you can't help being burned. You want to, we always need to be drawing closer to God that there's no, there's no static state in our relationship with God. We're either growing, going closer to him or we're falling further away. So Again, my recommendation is to, you know, start each morning with David's prayer in Psalm 51, 10 through 12. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. So we need to humble ourselves and ask and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. So we never stop needing a savior and we always have, we always have a choice of whether or not we, we respond to the Holy Spirit. So anyway, um, that's not for this week. If you have any more questions about the fig tree or if anything I've said that you feel like I left something out, just let me know. But let's just end this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the day and for this time. We thank you for your just amazing grace and love for us. We thank you, Lord, that you are constantly calling to us and that you are constantly uh, drawing people nearer to you. I thank you for pouring out the spirit of grace and supplication upon each person that listens and upon our community so that we we have a humble and willing heart and that we are willing to obey you. I pray for the favor and grace of God on each person that listens. And we thank you, Lord, that you are you're with us in, in um, every one of our circumstances. We thank you for all of this in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, well, that's enough for the week, and I will see you next time.